the trouble with the, the most horrible thing I know that happens in evangelism today. We don't value the human soul. When are we going to get serious about being serious about the most serious thing in the world, the birth of people at the altar? I watched the close of a service in Dallas a few weeks ago. At the end, about 15 people came in four, four minutes. They said a prayer and gone away. Well, the, my reaction to that, brother, was this. I can't get my car through a car wash in four minutes. Can they pass from death unto life? Can they put off the old man and put on the new man, as you use the figure? Can they get married to Christ in four minutes? Of course not. In fact, when you read uh, Seven Pentecostal Pioneers, which everybody should read because it's still printed, it tells you there that they had one place where they had meetings for th three weeks, and I forget the number, something like 964 people came and everyone was dealt with personally. We used to go to a city without money and pitch a tent and stay there 12 weeks. The churches are still there 60 years after. But everybody came to the altar. If you came, I come with a Bible at the side of you and ask you what your problem was. You wanted to be saved, we took you through the scriptures. If we spent an hour, so what? Well, going back, uh, Brother Larry, I said uh, we've turned the light out in the street. We've no more uh, street meetings. We've turned the light out Sunday night. Many churches don't have a Sunday night meeting Wednesday night. That's about the biggest tragedy. People say, don't you think we should get the Bible back in school? I said, that's not the first problem. We'll get it back in the home. Why don't, how many people meet? Ask the deacons in your church. Ask the pastor. How many of you have family worship? They don't have it. As soon as supper's over, they have to go and uh, get on TV and leave it till the kiddies go to bed. They don't know the Word of God. I had a man here, and his daughter came to bring me some mail, and, and I, she's 14. I said, well, dearie, how much scripture do you memorize? Oh, I haven't memorized any. I said, can you memorize the Ten Commandments? She couldn't say the Ten Commandments. Two days after a young guy came, he lived across town. He has seven children. The eldest boy is 13. He's memorized every word of every chapter in, uh, in uh, Proverbs. And the other boy is 10, and he's memorized 12 chapters of Proverbs, every word. The man gets up with his wife at 4 to 4.30 in the morning. They have an hour together with the Word of God. They get the children up just after five and then teach them the Word of God and prayer. And then the children have a rest and the mother teaches them the rest of the day. She's homeschooling them how they do it. But those little kids are walking Bibles. But we don't know the Word of God. Two things we don't know. In fact, I say to the seminary men, do you know God? Well, I, I, I didn't know, no. I, I answer yes or no. Oh, oh, I learned Hebrew. I didn't ask if you know Hebrew. Do you know God? You got asked ten young people in your church to answer in, in less than 50 words, why did Jesus come into the world? To save us from hell, to save us from sin. And so they go on. But what does Jesus say in, in John 17, 2? That they may know thee, the only true God. And that's the answer. We don't know God. If we knew God, we'd set the world on fire. If he knew God, he wouldn't beg for money. We know things about God, but we don't know God. We don't know God. Well, before the meeting at night, we went in a side room and they had hot tea and cold tea and drinks and fruit and everything, and trivia talking and straight off there to the platform. How do you suddenly turn off and suddenly become spiritual? We travel the country, but I walk the length of England, I walk the breadth of England with five college fellows. We slept in fields at night, we slept in churches. We didn't get a penny wage in six months, and nobody ever said a word. Because at night, we'd kneel in the street at 10 and 11 o'clock at night, and people get saved in the street. You don't care a who where you sleep. We slept in sleeping bags for three years. Slept on the floor of churches, anywhere they'd take us in. But we had revival. The churches are still standing today. But now, I go to a meeting, and everybody's silly. Oh, it's nice to see you. And they want to talk. I say, oh, leave, leave me alone. We went, we went, brother, we had a solid hour of prayer together, 11 o'clock to 12 in the morning. Then we had a bit of a rest in the afternoon and mostly went to prayer. Then we had a prayer meeting one hour before the night service, went on the platform, charged with the power of God and full of expectation and faith. And night by night the altars were lined with people. We don't do that today. We've got Miss So-and-so, she's number one on the charts. We've got So-and-so. And it's humanism, we're depending on something we have. I mean, you clap, you go to one charismatic meeting, you've been to them all, you stand and sing for 30, 40 minutes. We're trying to work something up when God has to send something down. I can remember, dear brother, when you went to a holiness meeting in England or, or a Pentecostal, 
there were more people at the altar before the service than after. I used to fear going when I was 14. I used to go, my daddy used to take me to a Pentecostal meeting, and the whole row at the front would be full, and they'd be praying with energy and, and crying to God. One old man particularly would say, come Lord and walk in our midst. And I used to think, I hope he doesn't, because I'm scared to death he would. But God used to come in the meeting. And then at the end, he didn't have to beg and sing emotional songs. There's room at the cross. I forget it. There's room on the cross. Forget there's room at the cross. Get on the cross. And as Tozer said, a man going down the road with a cross, you know one thing about him, he wasn't coming back. Our people don't want to die. There's only two kinds of people in the world, those who are dead to sin and those who are dead in sin. And we're in one of two. In fact, you talk about victory, they laugh at you. Oh, you can't live in victory. Well then, why, why don't you be a Buddhist to somebody? What do you do with somebody that says, Look, I don't just want to get I want to be pure in heart. You can't be pure in heart. Who says so? One of the latest books off the press says you can't. Who cares a hill of being? What does the Word of God say? What did Jesus say to the bad woman that came to him? Go and sin less? He says that to a woman who's been spending in immorality before the cross. What does, what does Paul say? Let him that stole steal less. No study is cut off. And that's Saturday free, and I can come back Sunday and get to the office for Monday morning. So I said, I went there, the meeting was crowded. In one meeting, Evan Roberts comes in, there's 800 people, which isn't big for America, but there it's the largest hall in town. And Evan walks down to the front seat, sits down, bows his head, and prayed for three hours. Our people walk out. But then he stood up for 15 minutes, he said, you ever heard not like it in your life? The Holy Ghost came upon him, and he was a big man. When he prayed, God just came down as though he jumped in the audience. And that happened more than once. He just, after he'd uh, prayed for three hours and spoke for 50 minutes, he went out. At 10 o'clock at night, he prayed the whole night for the anointing for the next day. Our guys don't do that. They go sit and talk and say silly jokes. We want to be spiritual and carnal, spiritual, carnal, hot and cold, all out for God, all out for the cowboys. God says no. The Bible says it's pray without ceasing. It doesn't say preach without ceasing. It doesn't say do miracles. It says pray. And well, like somebody may ask me if I know you fellows. Well, I'd say, well, I've met them, but I don't, I don't know anybody till I've prayed with him. I don't care who he is. And I know some of the outstanding personalities in the world today, but I haven't prayed with them, so I don't know them. There's a hunger now. Young men in this country have never seen revival. They've never seen meetings that go until two or three in the morning. People that won't go home. Or if they do go home, say, I can't eat, I can't turn on my TV. I'm so hungry for God. I'm so tired of my neighbors going to hell. I'm told my daughter came home and tells me she's pregnant. My son came home, he's on drugs. There's all kinds of messing, even amongst believers, even amongst the pastors, children. So what we, what we need to rediscover the value of a human soul. Our people need to be taught what repentance is, what the atonement is, what forgiveness is, what pardon is, what justification is, what the witness of this. They don't know. They want to kneel down and in five minutes pass from death to life and become a full-blown Christian. It can't happen. Everyone's work should be a manifest for the day shall declare it. Well, let's, let's put it in a nutshell. Dear brothers, when you and I go to the judgment, we're not going to have our passports checked. We're going to have our baggage checked. What have we been collecting all our lives? If men build about, okay, well, look at verse 13. If any, anyone's work shall be made manifest, the day shall declare it because it will be revealed by fire. The fire shall show the man's work what sort, not what sight it is. Now, if any man's work abide which is built there on issue of a reward, now look at this 15th verse, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved by fire. Now look at verse 17, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Now what do you do? God's going to destroy that man. Did Jimmy Swaggart ever think he will stand before five billion people, or you and I will, with all the archangels there, all the apostles of the, old, of the New Testament, all the... 
prophets of the Old Testament gazing on me and God reads my record out. We've lost sight of the judgment. If we began every meeting in the light of the judgment, we'd be prostrate before the end of this service. We wouldn't think about running home to turn the lousy TV on. The early Pentecostal meetings, brother used to go at eight in the morning and stay till five or six at night. They had a meal on the grounds, uh, particularly in America. And then have an afternoon session and an evening session, have three or four sermons. I don't know where you have to go to that. But this is, nobody's answered my question. Him shall God destroy. Not his record be destroyed, but he shall be destroyed. How can a man mix with a harlot when he knows his body is the temple of the Holy Ghost and that is only in his head? I mean, the body is the temple. Isn't it awesome when you think two men five years ago had the world at their feet? Jimmy Swaggart got arrogant because he said God called him to evangelize the world in the first place, that's wrong. He said there's nobody to go to. David Wilson went to him two years before that mess up. He went to PTL two years before and told them, and they wouldn't listen to him. It's no good saying they'd no friends. They were so arrogant, they became alone to themselves. Nobody dared correct them. They wouldn't listen to counsel. They got on a crest, on a, as they say in the world, they got on a roll. Swaggart's taking three million a week in. I, I hear he still takes in a nearly million a week. But where's the power? I'm not looking for a, a, a modern Elijah. I'm looking for a, a kind of a hundred Elijahs in different areas to, to come. We've had all the other. So what about, I wrote to a guy this, as I say, two o'clock, three o'clock this morning. Lo, he comes with clouds. When he comes, he's going to be terrible in his majesty. Nobody's going to jump on his knee or say, Papa, I've come to see you. Forget it. We're going to thought, I mean, if John fell at his feet as dead, and John used to lay his head on his bosom, what are you and I going to do? But we don't live in that realm. We don't live in the realm of the Spirit. We live in the realm of reason. And we've reasoned, oh, God is a loving God. He doesn't send more judgment. He does, and he's going to do. I think we're heading for the next, unless a miracle happens, we'll have a financial class within three years, a bankruptcy, which may do something, but on the other hand, I don't believe that if we had two earthquakes and one went north to south, other way, and, and America was in four pieces, that people would repent. They only repent when conviction of sin comes. You can't deny the Holy Ghost is office right. When he is coming, you will convict, com, convict of sin and righteousness and judgment to come. We don't live in that area. I mean, nobody expects Jesus to come today. They say they do, but if they do, he that hath this soap in him purify. It doesn't say when he is come, he'll give us 24 hours notice. If we're in purity, he'll call us. If we're in purity, he won't call us. Well, we should be like him, not, not an hour after he comes, not a day after, but that very moment, if I'm not walking in the will of God in known purity, I don't believe we'll be taken. Doesn't matter if you're pastor of the biggest church in town or Ten times as big as Billy Graham won't make any difference. All our ideas are perverted anyhow. There's not much meekness. Blessed the meek, they shall inherit the earth. Well, dear God, where is there meekness anymore? Oh, we have the biggest church in town. We're on so many radio stations. Oral Roberts used to say that. Swaggart said it. So what's he got them? God is a jealous God. The, the fellow that's taken up the, uh, to be assistant of, of Dr. Criswell, he blasted uh, uh, Baylor University, the mess it's in. But then guys told me going to Baylor, uh, it's not known any longer as a spiritual place. It's known now as a, well, it's a liberal arts college, and it's known mostly for its football team. But why do the kids suddenly... I have no appetite when they get teenagers get away from home or won't have to go to church Sunday night. My folk have made me go every time. There's no appetite. So there's no relationship with God. And if we spent time at the altar and took them through step by step what it means to become a Christian, your life is hid with Christ in God. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. That You've no time of your own. You've no money of your own. You've no interest of your own. Christ must become a complete master. We don't do that. And unless we do, we're not going to have a change.
I mean, there are people who are really hungry. There are people that meet Dave Wilkinson's folk on the streets. Well, I've never seen a Christian in my life. Well, what, what they say, the average church member is just like us. Very often they're smoking until they go in the meeting at last. The last minute when they come out, it's the cowboys or something. Where's the difference? And it isn't there. But it all comes down, it, it, I don't care whether it's Swaggart or PTO, it comes down, it breaks down with personal devotion to Christ. They quit praying, they quit reading the Word of God, they haven't time. And therefore they start rotting from the inside. There isn't a nation big enough to destroy America, we'll destroy ourselves. The present rate of development in herpes and AIDS is appalling. The, list, the lid hasn't been taken off the thing yet. I don't think the government dare tell us what's happening in the country. I've heard men say I was born again, I went to the cross, I've had my, I've had my upper room experience. I've never heard a man say I get so many experience. I've broken, my dad was the nearest of that. My dad couldn't say grace at mealtime without tears. Right now I have invitations to seven different, I'm not going to one. I said, because if people say, what's happening in America? I can't say there's revival anywhere, I know. I said, do you think I'm going to talk to them about the Holy Ghost revival when we're dying and doomed and damned here and we're running into worse trouble? Well, isn't there scriptures? What does God say? I can't give you glory because you honor one another. Sorry. That's one of the biggest hindrances we have. No, what did they say on the, on, the, on the day of Pentecost? Men and brethren, what shall we do? We're panicking with... Well, the altar doesn't mean anything to people now. They come out every week. We're Romanizing our Protestant. Oh, get your sins forgiven and go back and do the same lousy thing. It's ridiculous. You don't do that if you go to death. When you die to self, you die to business promotion, you die to ambition, you lay it all out and say, we mean this with bits like God go on record. Put us on record. I go and hear a fellow and he preaches. There's no passion, there's no tears, there's no... You know, I'd, I'd rather, like Richard Baxter, I preached as if to never preach again, and as a dying man to dying men, no. You think this fellow's a professional, he gets paid, and when he, when he steps out of the pulpit, he says, Hey, John, uh, what about a, a round of golf on Wednesday or Thursday? And immediately they switch from the spiritual and eternal to some stupid thing. I wouldn't take any notice of them anyhow. I'd say, Pastor, live it, live it, live it. Don't tell me to pray, meet with me. I mean, the first greatest revival in England was the Wesleyan revival that went to 90, no, the Wesleyan revival, and then the next one was the Salvation Army, which that went into 70 countries in 90 years, not 70, but 70 countries. Dear God, they had the most amazing night prayer meetings and training students and getting down to the Bible and prayer. And every week they were taken to a night of prayer and they were taken to street meetings somewhere in London. They were meeting sin head on and visiting taverns, talking to harlots, which nobody does know except just about Dave Wilkinson and, and Tim Delaney down in, uh, in the Motor City there doing the same thing. But we're, we're all sitting inside for our Ted John Wimber. I said, why do you sit inside a four wall singing, let the earth hear his voice? It doesn't make sense. Let the earth hear his voice, get out, stand on a box, call a man to witness, call a woman to witness, sing a hymn. He can't preach very much to crowds, but before long you say we're going to be here every Saturday night for the next winter and, or, or summer. And they come with expectation, they plan the shopping like people used to do with us. They plan to come shopping on Saturday, Friday night and Saturday night because we're in the town square. And hey, we didn't miss for three years. And our young people came, you didn't have to whip them, they came eagerly, you know, give them a chance to witness it. I said, if anybody stands on this box who isn't telling the truth, you interrupt them because I'm the leader and I said, I'll check on them. Don't let a man talk when he's not walking it. If he's walking in it, if, he, if the man is in your factory, your office, uh, if they're not telling the truth, come and tell me, you know, chase them off. Well, we didn't need to advertise in the paper, dear God, I was the best known man in town. Even though the cathedral was only 300 yards away from us, magnificent cathedral. I only got 500 Sunday night, they stood outside and lined up like a movie house. But the cathedral got 50. So where do you go? I mean, the cathedral is ornate, it had gold plate on the, or gold uh, communion things and candlesticks on the altar. 
It, it was like a miniature Westminster Abbey stained glass windows. But what is that to the glory of God? I mean, our place was packed an hour before time. Our prayer meetings were packed. We had three prayer meetings a week and three street meetings, and that's why that church kept in continuous revival for the three years I was there. And it's still there today. Well, you think we're going to... It's not what's just in the book of life, as Tosa said to me one day. He said, Leonard, I don't think I'm ashamed of what I've done since I was saved. It's what I could have done that troubles me, and not what I did, but why I did it. God is going to weigh the motives. I mean, I had D. Cameron Morgan say, I had talked with a friend of mine the other day, and he'd been preaching in a church I love to go to, Monk. Cameron Morgan said. How did he get on? He said, oh, he said, I enjoyed myself. He said, he did. He enjoyed his oratory. He enjoyed his rapport with the people. He enjoyed his eloquence. He enjoyed himself. What did God get? The, the question when I finish a meeting is, I didn't get anything out of this meeting. What did God get out of it? What do people say going out? I think, dear brother, if I was where God wants me to be, where I should be, I would leave a meeting with tears running down my face at the glory of God, or that all these people outside are glued to the TV this afternoon, this Sabbath day, and they're not a bit interesting, God. Christ could die on the main street today. It won't interest them at all. But we've got, I, I think we've got to preach till people know that we mean what we say. Edwin Hatch was uh, Chancellor of, uh, I think, St. Mary's Co Co College in Oxford, uh, one of the best guys in England. But one day, even though he had crowds and everything, he, he got so tired, he went in his office and he wrote that gorgeous hymn, Breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with life anew. And the last time to breathe on me, breath of God, till I am wholly thine, till all this earthly part of me glows with thy fire divine. People ask me, how do you, you've been preaching 70 years now, how do you keep an edge? Because I read stories on revival, because I read the word of God, and I see what the apostle did that Paul can laugh at death and laugh at hardship and sit in the lousiest prison in the world and tell other people to rejoice. Or he can give you 2 Corinthians 11 and go down seven times in fearlessness and the fasting, in perils of the deep, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils, perils, but enough to kill ten men. And glory in tribulation. Doesn't just find grace to get through. He welcomes it. He said, this is the only way. Because when we get to heaven, uh, dear brother, God is going to ask you where your diploma is. He's not looking for medals, he's looking for scars. We don't have to join in every effort that they're making the city to have a revival. Forget it, we've been doing that for 20 years. Stay at the place of prayer. It doesn't matter who comes to town to preach. We're going to stay together and pray Friday night from 9 till 11 to 9 to 12. I've done that always. Every city I've been in, I've started a pastor's prayer meeting usually on a Monday when they're washed out and tired and they come from all denominations. There's no alternative to prayer and obedience. said a man going down the road with a cross, you know, one thing about him, he wasn't coming back. Our people don't want to die. There's only two kinds of people in the world, those who are dead to sin and those who are dead in sin. And we're in one of two.